Uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, Craig Dugan. Uh, Craig's going to be taking us through hydrogen and biogas. And Craig, I'll get you to uh, to share your screen. Um, Craig is has. Uh, is an accomplished executive uh, looking after uh, companies. He grew the uh, process group um, into a, to a global engineering force uh, over many years working there. And since then, he's moved on to be the managing director for Optimal and, and uh, with their focus on green fuels and green, uh, um, elect, uh, green um, uh, initiatives. Uh, it's great to have such an experienced uh, and managing director driving this uh, innovation. Um, Craig, hand over to you and, and look forward to hearing about what's going on with uh, green energy alternatives. Thank you, Jared, for that very kind uh, introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Now, I, I, I like to use a lot of slides so that you don't fall asleep. So uh, you need to concentrate on what, what's coming up, um, but this will obviously be available uh, later on. So, um, so what are we, what the challenge, and the, Jared put some slides up before about uh, the, the problem that we have uh, in terms of industrial energy. It's not all currently uh, uh, required as just electricity from sockets and cables. There's a huge number of industries that require high temperature heat and currently the, you know, the best solution for that is probably with natural gas uh, compared to coal because you can have low emissions. But increasingly there is a focus on the emissions from burning natural gas and also the emissions from producing natural gas. And, you know, we see many of our food type customers that uh, over 70% over of their energy requirements are thermal. So uh, we need, in order to get, you know, if you get companies chasing net zero by 2030, uh, the challenge is how do they get there uh, quickly uh, with what you know with existing technology, and we think that green gas uh, is the solution. Now that green gas doesn't you know, we're, we're agnostic on the molecules. It can be hydrogen, it can be biomethane, uh, it could it can be a mix of those uh, as long as it can go into existing combustion equipment. Uh, so. Food waste, everyone knows this, food waste is a massive problem for the world, not only because it, people should be eating it, but when we dispose of it in landfill, uh, it has it produces greenhouse gases, and these greenhouse gases just add to the problems that we already have. Australia, unfortunately, is a laggard in this area. Um, currently, uh, uh, over 40% of our waste is still going into landfill. Compare that to Western Europe, they're down to rates below sort of four than three percent. So we've got a lot of material still going to landfill, which should be being converted into energy. Uh, Europe has, uh, as I said, has learned this lesson, uh, and uh, that slide there just shows the amount of biogas that's already being produced in Europe. And initially, most of that biogas was being produced sort of on farm or at at, at source and being turned into electricity, but increasingly as renewables have saturated the grid with low cost renewable electricity, more and more that gas is finding its way into the natural gas infrastructure. Um, so how does that sort of translate in the Australian context? So this is the Victorian uh, wholesale cost of gas uh, since 2014, and no surprises, you can see that the cost trend is upwards. And I want to show that because well, the first thing when you talk about renewable gas, everyone says, oh, well, it's, it's too expensive. Well, you know, the interesting thing is, is that you can produce biogas now uh, and get it into the grid for, we believe, around about eight to $10 a gigajoule, which is directly comparable against current natural gas prices. So we think the market is right. So how are you gonna use this? So this is just, um, what to do. So, um, yeah, and, and most people sitting on this presentation today would be aware of these sorts of things. But what we're saying is use natural gas, could then through your electricity retailer, get uh, a green gas contract, and then use that natural gas to produce energy behind the meter. And you can do that in cogeneration, tri generation, or quad generation. So, uh, in, with our turbines, Typically, our 65 kilowatt turbine produces 65 kilowatts of electricity and 155 kilowatts of recoverable heat. 
If we do that as hot water, it would be about 120 kilowatts to 85 degrees Celsius. Uh, our one megawatt package does about uh, 1.9 megs of heat. And again, depending on whether you do it direct by hot water or steam, then the amount that you get uh, can be reduced. Um, uh, you can, uh, as I said, you can do steam. So Alpha Laval have a uh, have a proprietary um, standard uh, steam generator which will fit onto our turbines or onto gas engines, and and you can also go to manufacturers HRSG manufacturers where you can co-fire these uh, these steam generators so you can put additional thermal energy in if you need more steam than is than is available from the heat of the turbine or the exhaust. And here's just, just some examples uh, of this. This one on the top left is one we're doing at the moment for uh, Costa uh, Foods in Gyra in New South Wales, a huge hothouse. I think it's about 30 hectares. And we're doing what we call quad gen there. So we've got a turbine which is producing electricity. The turbine is currently fueled on LNG. The, we do hot water heat recovery at 85 degrees. That goes into huge hot water storage tanks and used at night time. Uh, the cooled exhaust is then used to directly fire their existing uh, eight megawatt boiler. And by using hot, that, that warm air, we recover that, that warm air that's in that exhaust. Uh, and that exhaust is then finally cooled and goes directly into the hothouse for CO2 fertigation because they want 800 ppm CO2 on the hothouse. That's, in fact, you can see there, there that's the boiler and here's the hot air mixing. Uh, we're doing a project for McCain's where we're taking biofuel bio from an anaerobic digester, uh, making power, and again using the hot air firing of their for their existing boiler, and that takes about a 15% thermal load or natural gas load off their existing boiler. So all these things are, uh, I mean, this is all existing kit, existing technologies, just further enabled by the availability of biofuels. So we think biogas has got massive potential. We think any, any customers or any companies that have the potential to generate biogas behind the meter are sitting on a resource as valuable or potentially more valuable than, than behind the meter solar. Um, but those customers who don't have that, hopefully in the not too near future, they'll be able to get green gas from the grid. Just an example of what this looks like behind the grid, sorry, behind the meter. So McCain's in Ballarat, 600 tonnes a day of potatoes to make 400 tonnes a day of French fries, 200 tonnes a day of waste. That waste uh, we are using to, uh, you can see here, we're using that to generate 1.2 megs of electricity. And the thermal heat from that, from the, our turbine exhaust is going directly into their boiler. Now what's interesting at this site is that they put in, uh, they put in a, P, uh, a PPA um, solar installation behind the meter, seven megawatts. And you can see here, that's their reduction in CO2 emissions, so about 11,000 tonnes per annum. Our turbine, which is only generating 1.2 megawatts of electricity, has provided a larger CO2 emissions reduction for them because we're displacing a lot of natural gas. So, uh, so you can see, you know, together, these two technologies uh, provide a really good overall reduction in in CO2 footprint, but also a reduction in energy cost to the customer. And that's just another summary slide of some of the, uh, the, the things. Now, what we can also do there is if that customer had additional hydrogen, or sorry, additional solar, or they wanted to put more solar in, we could, we could use that solar to produce some behind the meter hydrogen, and that hydrogen could then be used in the boilers, in the turbines, or both. Uh, and because they have wastewater that obviously comes out of their anaerobic digester, uh, then the oxygen from the electrolyzer could be used to help clean up the wastewater. So further, further opportunities for McCain's to go even further on their emissions. So just on the, so on the subject of hydrogen, we work with ITM Power out of the UK. They, they manufacture um, PEM, uh, uh, so proton electron membrane uh, exchange, um, uh, membra membranes for uh, the production of hydrogen. They've got what they've got their gigafactory in Sheffield, and they've just announced that they're going to double the capacity of that and build a third plant somewhere else in the world. 
Uh, we've got these units at Toyota, Bulwer Island, uh, there's two at Fortescue and there's more in the pipeline. So the opportunity for hydrogen, uh, and I think the, the, the immediate opportunity for hydrogen, while it's using more expensive electrons, is I think primarily around heavy vehicle fuels, so trucks, trains and, and buses. Uh, there are obviously hydrogen cars around, but I think the real opportunity is for, is for heavy vehicles. But as that cost of hydrogen does come down, I think more and more we'll see hydrogen being blended into our natural gas networks, and possibly we might even see pure hydrogen gas networks, as has been done in Europe. So the beauty about electrolyzers, and this is if you think about the, in the context of grid stability, with renewables going up and down, a PEM electrolyzer is very rapid responding. So you can actually attach PEM electrolyzers to the grid and you can use them for demand response. And as we've seen in recent times, FCAS and demand response are also mechanisms for connected customers to generate income. Um, the, the, the stacks themselves are, are, are quite simple. Uh, you, used, uh, you used deionized water uh, and you produce ox oxygen uh, at low pressure and hydrogen at between 20 and 30 bar. So that's quite good, that higher pressure hydrogen uh, for downstream uses. And the beauty about this technology is it's modular. So the smallest electrolyzer that ITM do at the moment, it's 670 kilowatts, um, but they're now, and they package that in, uh, in modules of three, if you like, up to uh, two, two megs. And then after that, they've got their 2.5 meg uh, um, module, which can then be packaged up to the much larger 10 megawatt and over systems that are currently going in. And that's the, the 10 meg one that you can see right there. That's at, uh, at a project in, in Germany. So uh, we're so convinced about the opportunity with renewable gas is that we've actually now formed optimal renewable gas. And I'm pleased to advise that we've recently signed an MOU with a large uh, a partner to produce what we believe will be Australia's biggest um, and first bio LNG project. Um, so, uh, and our aim is to have uh, grid scale biogas projects up the east coast of Australia, both doing LNG and biogas to grid for our existing natural gas connected uh, turbine customers. So, you know, if you look at Australia's natural gas networks, we have a fantastic network of pipelines. So the opportunity to inject natural uh, biomethane into our pipelines is enormous. And what's more is that you can get access to the secondary mains, the lower pressure mains, uh, which are directly connected to customers, and you can do this at lower pressure and at a reduced cost. Um, we've also been working on, on other ways to use hydrogen. So we're about to, we've sold our first 100% hydrogen turbines, uh, one to Gemina and another one to the Blue Economy in Tasmania. We've also delivered to, Gen to Gemina a fuel cell, a 30 kilowatt fuel cell, which uses a Ballard fuel cell stack. Um, and, and we believe that these hydrogen, both turbines and electrolyzers, will have a really strong um, of, uh, business case in powering things like data centers, um, in combined heat and power, or cooling applications, because quite often, the, while fuel cells are really good in terms of their efficiency at 55%, the recoverable waste heat is not really very um, high grade. So if you put turbines and, and fuel cells together, then you can get the benefit of the base load, high efficiency of the fuel cell. And then from the turbine, you can get electricity and waste heat. So we think there's a really strong case for these technologies to be coupled. Um, we're also doing work with another American company that's working with Capstone. And this is, you know, gas turbines are thermal driven devices. So if you can get any heat in there, then, then you can drive a turbine. So they're 24 seven are developing uh, a solar concentrator to go onto turbines. And we think that's quite interesting. Um, I can give some more information on that. Uh, and all of this stuff obviously feeds, feeds into microgrids and those microgrids can include all of these sorts of technologies that we've just talked about. Um, another way to get heat into uh, turbines is a, a German company called B&K who have done an external combustor on a capstone micro turbine. So here they're combusting renewable wood chips from furniture factories and then turning that waste heat 
into to drive um, the capstone micro turbine. So lots of different ways that you can generate heat and power from uh, from waste energy sources or renewable sources. Thank you. Craig, many thanks. And uh, wow, uh, so optimal not sitting on its hands here. The market's moving quickly and apparently you guys are too. So uh, great, great to see. Thanks for all that uh, coming through there, Craig. Uh, I've only got about 50 questions, but I'll try and narrow it down. I was going to ask about digest state and, and what have you, but great and, and, and a comment that great to see bio LNG. I don't think I've heard of that term before because everyone was just thinking biogas, no worries, just using it in a, in, a, in a network. I don't think anyone had been thinking about the, the bigger potential to, to export that, so great. Um, for everybody out there, um, um, please throw some questions in the Q&A and, and, or the chat and, uh, and uh, Craig will get back to you. But Craig, I just had to, uh, one question there on, on sort of uh, the government support to, that's available for you. We mentioned before this, uh, the new uh, method coming for biomethane, but for a project like you did with McCain, some 14,000 tonnes per annum of CO2 abatement, a, a really enormous amount. I mean, what was available? Uh, is that uh, McCain's uh, going to be getting a, a VEKs or ACUs or LGCs? What's 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 going to be used down there? Uh, look, they. I mean, they they did that project on you know on their own internal returns. So there's no grant money. Uh, there's no at the moment uh, other than what they've got with their solar. They certainly haven't got any um, any credits back uh, on the biogas side of it. Um, they will be working on that, but the key. The key driver there was that, that they, they needed to go ahead with the project and didn't really want to wait for uh, particular government programs. So it was sort of, um, let's get it done, um, uh, rather than let's wait to see what, what money we can get from governments. Yeah, indeed. Um, and and we, we see that, um... There's that hesitancy where it, with some organisations, they're like, well, I'm not really sure what I'm going to get out of these uh, these grants and what have you. So the business case has to stack up on its own. Uh, yeah, and that's, it's, it's, yeah. that's very true. And, you know, the beauty about, you know, if you've got behind the metre energy resources available to you, you know, you, if you compare that to the risk of, you know, grid power, grid gas, I mean, those, those costs are only going one way. So... I think one of the increasingly attractive things for industry is that if you do this behind the meter uh, or you do some behind the meter as a, as a part of your energy mix, what you're doing is you're locking in those costs and giving yourself uh, um, energy surety where you really don't have any off the grid at the moment. Indeed. Good one. Uh, Craig, there's a question there in the chat. I'll get you to answer those uh, if you don't mind while, while we move on to our, to our next speaker, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks for that, Craig. Uh, 